Welcome to episode two of the Marky Microwave podcast. This episode is the second half of our conversation about Marky's growth and evolution from a small scale mixer manufacturer to a diversified mimic technology company. In this installment, Doug and Chris discuss the fundamental differences between the hybrid and IC business model, how Marky strategically positioned itself to compete in the semiconductor area, and what it takes to design elite RF products for the most demanding customers in the world. So at the end of the last episode, uh, we were talking about the diode supply and how that drove um, changes from the traditional hybrid, you know, the 50-year-old hybrid mixer model to the mimic, uh, mic, the mimic device model that we're using today. Um, so can you explain the difference between uh, the supply chain for uh, the mimic, the microlithic or a hybrid mixer versus the supply chain for uh, a mimic, an arbitrary mimic. Yeah, so this is critical to understanding the calculus behind the, the plan to move to mimic. Um, because we had so many issues with hybrid supply chain, uh, specifically with the diodes, um, but it went beyond that. Basically everything on the bill of materials that we needed to buy to make a hybrid mixer was at various times of our history at danger or in danger. The Mimic supply chain is a lot different because it's essentially just one company, a foundry, who builds the product and then you take those dye and you package them yourself or you give you, know, you sell them directly to the customer as bare dye or you put them into some kind of surface mount package like a QFN. So fundamentally the supply chain of Mimic is 90% dye or foundry and then maybe 10% other but with a hybrid mixer, services, it's yeah, yeah. And then there's, and there's the services associated with it, which is much more, I would say, diverse, and you have more options. So you're not as sole sourced. Well, you're you're very sole sourced with the, the foundry. <laughs> yeah, uh, you cannot just easily port foundries, as you know, Hittite discovered, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, prior to the sale to analog, but uh, the the main difference is that. There are more weight. There are more suppliers needed to buy the materials to make a hybrid mixer yep. than for a mimic. And you're sensitive to all of those suppliers. And every single one of them matters. And you're constantly playing whack a mole with yep. which which item on the bill of materials is causing the performance degradation you're seeing, or is it your own fault because your assembl you know your 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 assembler skill is a part of the quality. Right. Whereas in a mimic. It's pretty much, did the foundry build it properly? Well, and the foundry uh, only has to do it once. This right. is this is a, a, an operations change that was really huge for the company, which is that when you build a, a hybrid mixer or even a, a microlithic mixer, you build them 100 at a time. Whereas when you build a mimic mixer, you build them as, as many as you can uh, at a time at least one wafer's worth. Um, and typically you build more than a wafer. So you really only have to get it one, you only have to get it right during that short window of time when the parts are being fabricated and then you just have them indefinitely. Yeah, once you have the blueprints, you can make as many as you want right. and you can scale really at the push of a button, which is how many wafers do I buy? Yeah, so uh, they're, they're Pretty dramatic uh, differences in terms of um, the operations side of the company that I want to talk about in a little bit. But from a design standpoint, is there a dramatic difference in the way that you like uh, imagine that you have a requirement or an idea for a coupler versus an idea for a, a mimic mixer or some other mimic product? Is there a big difference in the design process between those two types of products? <laughs> That's okay. Well, you you're asking that because you know it's loaded. The, the answer, <laughs> I mean, we could have we could have a four hour discussion on this because yeah. it's like I, I suppose a passion of ours. Um, okay. the The simple answer is, well, it depends on the engineer. Is really the answer. If you're my dad you design by instinct and empirical prototyping. And that was the the ethos of, let's say, his era, where you didn't have 
as good of access to simulation tools. Like there were some, but maybe they took forever to solve. Um, so the answer to how you design a coupler versus an IC or something like that comes down to the engineer. If you're my dad, you design by intuition and empirical evidence. Uh, you build prototypes, you you play with the prototypes in the, in the bench, and you, you hack and burn until you get what you like, and then you try to recreate that. And that is literally how almost all the components came to be in his era, uh, from you know filters to mixers to couplers. Everybody had their own kind of hacks, and, and they, were, they were physical hacks, not, not software hacks. Yeah. And um, so you could get away with that for a long time. My dad got away with that his entire career. He's never used a computer to design anything. Uh, I came into the paradigm where everything is simulated or you expect to simulate the majority of what you do because the simulation tools are good enough and the computers are fast enough to where it's worth it to invest almost all your time in the software. So the answer is for me, the jump to going from couplers to microlithics to mimics was seamless and inconsequential because everything built on itself. Mm. I had already been designing in 3D for all of my passive products and we had invested a lot of money and time in getting HFSS up to speed and learning how to integrate microwave office into what we do. And so really there was nothing, there was no extra amount of work when it came to simulating IC mixers, except that we came to understand that simulating IC mixers was far more accurate mm. than simulating every other mixer we'd ever done because the diode models were rock solid and they were produced wafer after wafer after wafer exactly the same way. Or at least from our perspective, they were identical. Maybe if you're a you know, CMOS guy, yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh, wow, this process yeah. wanders. But to a parts gallium RC, yeah, we're talking about parts per thousand maybe. Yeah. Um, so we, we do not experience the, the problem yeah. at all. Uh, and what this meant was that we started to think a lot more about investing more and more time in simulation all the way down to the junction of the device. Yeah. And this is something that I'm not sure if this is... I'm not, I don't know how apl applicable this is outside of microwave, if microwave might be the sweet spot. Uh, I remember when I was learning like microwave classes in undergrad, the professor would describe how you could take a line and trim it with a knife. And I thought that that was the most bizarre thing that I'd ever heard, that, that somebody would take a circuit and a knife and like carve it out and make, a, you know, try to improve a circuit that way. Because you can't... You can't really do that with um, a DC circuit because the, the exact shape of things doesn't matter. And you can't do that in optics uh, because you have to, the, the, the fabrication tolerances have to be so fine. Yep. And I think this is uh, so coming from the optics world into microwaves, it was shocking that the simulations were so accurate because in optics, you, I, I, I imagine that the simulations are just as accurate. Like my, Maxwell's equations work at every scale. Um, but you can't build it. But you can never build it. Right. Yeah. Like fabrication the, the tolerance, fab tolerance on the optical circuit you're yeah. doing are like so bad that yeah. you're guessing half the time. And, and we experience that a lot, right? Like every time you read an optics paper, you'd be like, eh, that's, you know, what, yeah. what, what, what did we use? Opsim or something? Or VPI yeah. is the thing we used at the time. And, and we all took it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Well, and if, you're getting, if you got into nonlinear device modeling, like in a laser, a semiconductor laser, there were like 500 different terms describing the optoelectronic interaction um, compared to a transistor model. You know, transistor models are complex enough um, with self-heating and with all the parasitics and um, uh, the, you know, if you, if you start to get into capacitances with the, the, the wafer, but the optical, when you add an optical element to it, it becomes completely unmanageable and the, the papers would have like 500 different terms in them. But you were doing passive simulations. Right. And in passive simulations, it's just Maxwell's equations and- It's pretty much perfect. Yeah, you're done. And it doesn't matter, the, the drawing on your screen could be a, a chip or it could be a coupler. Uh, theoretically, it could be yeah. a, a- It could be in inches antenna. or it could be in yeah. microns and it looks the same on the screen. It didn't matter to me, yeah. Yeah, you get into a to problems sometimes because you look at a drawing and you're like, 
it's only five mils, uh, but you think that you think that it's sufficient, uh, and then you realize when you actually fabricate it that you were drawing something extremely small that can't be fabricated by by any assembler. Right. Yeah. And so this is why, when it all really okay. So this comes down to you hadn't asked the question yet. I, I'm gonna lead lead the lead witness. The yeah. uh, so you bring up. Okay, so if you can establish that simulating couplers or simulating mimic amplifiers is essentially the same tool set, then what you start to say is, okay, well, why don't you design the most expensive thing you can make that you can sell the most of? Because you're roughly agnostic, right? You're a microwave engineer. You can do whatever you want, yeah. which, of course, we know is not true. But um, that question comes up inevitably if, if you have success with this design cycle. So... If we all have access to the same foundries, because they're, well, not always actually. Okay, so we can talk about that as a separate yeah, problem. Yeah, supply chain. But which, you know, if, if you're locked into a particular foundry, you have to choose the, your prom date carefully. And um, what separates you from some other smart engineer who also owns CST or HFSS or ADS, whatever the simulation tool du jour is, what separates the men from the boys or, you know, the elite all-stars from the bench players in the RF design space. And in my view, the answer is the ability to complete the design cycle accurately and measure what you simulate. So how do you do that? Uh, it's an iterative process of careful attention to detail with the ability to understand the packaging aspects of it. So and we come across this a lot when we interview students is that a, a, and, and I think we'll devote a lot of time on this podcast to talking directly to students about the fact that they're never going to design anything yeah, unless undergrad. unless they learn like far beyond what they learned in undergrad. And um, so the design process or say the product development like process ends far after like a year after the final simulation is done. So the, the first 10% of the work is the simulation, in my, in my view, if you're really rolling out a good product. I mean, after you've reviewed the literature and... Well, yeah, okay. You know, I'm, I'm assuming... Okay, I'm yeah. assuming... And you, once you are a world expert on the topic, and well, you start yeah. your design. Yeah, you yeah. can't become a designer until you're a world expert at something, right. in my opinion. This is the other thing that I think students totally don't understand, is it'll take you four years of reading papers to finally maybe come up with one slightly original idea. Unless you're a genius. Like, unless you're at the highest level of an engineer in their early 20s, you're not gonna have an original idea. And even people in their 30s don't really have original ideas. They usually just come up with the same similar concept to something that was done in 1965. So cute. <laughs> right, it's, it's, it's so novel, right? Uh, and of course, then they patent it and yeah. waste everybody's time uh, and pay lawyers, but. Get a bonus. Yeah. Uh, but the point I'm making is that what separates the best designers, and I use that the general term designer, is they understand what the tools can do, what the limitations of those tools are, and then they understand when they build the piece of hardware, because we're in the hardware business, right? right? We're not in the software business. So you have to build the thing and verify that your simulation worked. We got very, very good at that in the first, let's say, five to seven years I was here. What, so you, you say that uh, it's very important to get confirmation between the, the simulation that you do and the measurement. What are the pitfalls that uh, an engineer coming out of undergrad would typically fall into um, when doing a design that would make it not um, mat match up with the, their expected result? Okay, so there are many, okay, so there are a couple areas that I like to grill students on when we interview them. Uh, the first one is just talking about the simple idea that basic circuit elements don't act like basic circuit elements at microwave frequencies. Right. So that's just the basic fundamental physics of our field, which is that once the wavelength becomes comparable to the part or the, the circuitry that it's, that the energy is flowing through, weird things tend to happen, like capacitors stop acting like pure capacitors, and inductors start looking like weirdly capacitive, and 
it's uh in in some tools so some simulations will exhibit this and some will not it depends on the approach you're taking and so you have to understand the weaknesses of the simulator to really be gifted or uh, highly effective using them and that takes many many years so you can't come out of school and just know like oh a spiral inductor is not really an inductor after a certain frequency okay okay fine oh and the cue got terrible okay and uh the, it's physically too large and now all kinds of weird coupling issues are happening and my thing no longer looks like a low pass filter anymore right so um that's one uh the other thing and this is something that that we learned over time if you if you take enough care to simulate especially in 3d because 3d is is kind of like the truth telling serum if you simulate something in 3d and it still looks good and then you don't measure it like that it's almost always the measurements fault and this is something that we learned through time and i can't tell you how many engineers have come up to me and you and handed us measurements where we knew they measured it wrong right. because it didn't match the simulation yeah. and they're adamant that they measured it correctly <laughs> and then you say uh yeah there's a second harmonic leaking through because it's the synthesizer is not as clean as you think it is buddy yeah or there's a packaging problem or the connector is loose it's always the connector like that's yeah. what i blame, blame the connector <laughs> blame the connector blame the ground ground is mother yeah, the ground is not con the, the ground isn't soldered properly properly yeah and i think uh it's it's weird being in like i'm going back to the idea that this 3d simulations and specifically uh you know the finite element method simulations the uh hfss simulations that we use are rare in almost all of engineering because they are it's like god's own truth bestowed on you from the heavens there's I, I don't I can't think of another arena because every other any other simulation you do is an abstraction and certainly 3D simulations are an abstraction, um, but if you're talking about like two and a half D method of moments or uh, especially like a circuit schematic or if you go up another level to uh, the system simulators like Genesis, each time you each time you get more removed from a component from the component you add a level of abstraction that obscures some kind of uh, non ideality you've made an approximation yeah you're I, making I, an approximation. I think that's the be the best way to put it is like you know if, if you come from an applied physics background like we do yeah every class you take in grad school the professor at some point says okay these are our assumptions mm -hmm. and they'll write up a series of parameters and then it'll be like this one's much much greater than that one yeah. so we cancel that denominator yeah. or like you know it's it's everything becomes like some mathematical like uh flow down to a very simple equation but we know that in reality, all these other complicated things are happening. It's just that the variables were orders of magnitude larger or smaller than others. Right. In, in HFSS, you never have to do that. Yeah. It basically calculates everything for you. Yeah, yeah, if you're careful. But, you know, we don't take certain things into account. We, we, we pretty much ignore almost always anisotro anisotropy in the substrate. And you apparently informed me last week that that is not always true. Like Rogers told you that it may or it requires further study to yeah, know whether yeah. this is affecting Mr. It. Coonrod says yeah. so. Yeah, John Coonrod. So uh, we ignore that. Yeah, we ignore surface roughness almost always. Um, but you can simulate that. But well, there are things that are are simulatable, and there are things that are there. There are always things that are unknowable. Right. What is the exact thickness of each metal? Uh, you know, you have to still make approximations just to get the circuit to right. be drawable. Well, and that's a really, okay, so that's a really good point. Even with the HFSS, you're still making approximations. So by going through these design cycles many times, hmm. over time I learned which ones mattered and which ones didn't. Yeah. And so like you're always making this optimization between speed and accuracy in, in your design flow. And I learned which ones were really helpful and which ones I could throw away. So I almost do them, you know, by instinct now. I don't think about it when I'm clicking certain buttons in the in the menu. Um, I don't even know I'm clicking them anymore, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh, you uncheck that box, obviously. <laughs> oh, it just makes it go faster. I don't even remember why. Because like 10 years ago, I, I yeah. compared A, B, and it was fine. So that, and that wasn't obvious. So when I started doing mimics, it wasn't obvious which tricks I could play and which ones I couldn't. Like, what is the exact stack up 
on a conformally coded dielectric that goes over some kind of metal layer. Well, it's it's not planarized. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is maybe really esoteric if you haven't done this kind of work before. So the idea is this: if you have a uh, piece of metal deposited on a on a semiconductor and it gets etched, you have like these areas where there's metal and areas there are not. Well, then they deposit a plastic on top, like a dielectric layer, or they, you know, it could be silicon nitride or or Something poly polyimid, yeah, and it kind of coats everything, and it create, but it, it should it still exhibits some of the topology of the metal beneath it. Some processes they'll planarize it, some of them won't. The question is, does it matter, and how do you simulate that? That was really not clear to me when I started doing this. And because you could simulate these things and you'd be like, oh, well, it'll change the balance, you know, phase balance. Yeah. Or it'll or it'll change like which optimal width of the line I use. So over time, like, you know, you do this enough times and you just start like intuitively saying, ah, I know what to do. Well, and you do. Yeah, you do experiments for each one. Right. It's like I simulate it with and I simulate it without. One time I take the time to, to go through and actually actually do the work of, of making this more accurate and it doesn't make a difference so then in the future I don't do that yep. and it's the same way for, for doing measurements for doing characterization Right. one time you do the, the measurement with a filter the next time you're in that exact same situation you know whether you need to do that or not mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that's a very general rule for, um, for all engineers to understand yep. is that that's a universal lesson yeah. that's, I mean so you've described the scientific method <laughs> And and you you know isolate variables and change yeah. things and you monitor what happens. I, I'm pretty shocked how many people don't really have that skill coming out of school. Well, but I, I would say this is not the scientific method. This is the engineering method, which is what can you ignore? What parts uh, okay. of science yeah, 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 yeah. are you allowed to ignore and still have a functioning widget at mm -hmm. the end? Yeah. Because because as an engineer, you don't need to know all all the science. No. You just need to know what matters for the task at hand right well this is the this is the opposite problem that I feel like PhDs have coming out which is that they feel like they need to know everything to get before they have a product out the door and in engineering you don't need to know everything you need to know enough to make a viable product uh, that the market wants mm -hmm. but you don't need to know everything possible right so I, how do you make the distinction between like one of the first blog posts um, that that I remember you writing was, uh, "Know when to shoot the engineer." I don't think I actually used those words. I, I believe that, I, believe <laughs> I, I the think, publication would not allow it. Well, no, no, I I didn't. Yeah, well, we can talk about that some yeah. other day. But that that is such a charged statement. That, so that's <laughs> so okay. That's a phrase that my dad's engineering staff used. Describing when they were like WJ yeah. about when they were gonna you know complete a design and just you know put it into production. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously that the, back in those days the, the <laughs> it was a different climate of you know <laughs> yeah what offensiveness you and but also like you know there weren't as many shootings I guess but not so as so we had so maybe it's a no when to fire the engineer might be a better <laughs> we could call it that but it's colorful. So we do not advocate the, the hunting of engineers for sport or any other reason. No, no. Be, be kind to your engineers and let them out of the dungeon. Big, <laughs> big, big companies run by MBAs, let, let them out yeah. of the dungeon like they're nice people. Um, what's the question? <laughs> when do you uh, fire the engineer? When do I fire the engineer? Yeah. Okay. So it's like, when do I when fire do myself? And then uh, since I'm also like back in the day, I was also the business development person. Yeah. Who you've, done, you've done many, many generations of mixers and you could have... Yeah. You could have not released many of them. Okay, that you know, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, let's see. The truth is that when well, when I'm doing my own work, whenever I decide that I've done something good enough, um, maybe when my degree of self-loathing is so high <laughs> that I can't take it anymore, and I'm so disgusted by my my. Um, inability to make great product that I was just like, okay, it's good enough. Fine. Th there is an aspect to that, like this, this, uh, I think really good, really good designers have that, like 
nothing's quite good enough. It's like, you know, Elliot Smith, the musician, yeah. who's like a you know brilliant songwriter, the most depressed person ever. Yeah. Like, may That's have true. been murdered, but probably committed suicide. That guy, like, if you ever watch him in an interview, it's like he acts like he's the worst person to ever touch a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and you listen to his music and it makes you want to cry. You're like, he's like John Lennon reincarnated. He's amazing. I think that good designers do that. Uh, you're never satisfied. You always think, ah, oh, like, you know, I can hear the flat, the, the B flat is just a little flatter than I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that happens. So you, you fire the engineer and go to tape out. When you decide that you're no longer making any really fruitful progress and you're wasting the company's money. Uh, and this comes down really to a business problem that engineers need to understand, which is the company's paying for your time. Right. This is not your playground sandbox to make any fun HFSS model you want and then pound on it till the cows come home. You have to do something useful with your time. And so there, there becomes a, there's always a, some time in, in the design flow where the return on your hours of simulation don't pay off anymore. But you've come far enough down the road to where you've done a couple novel things. That's when it's time to fire yourself and say, okay, we're, we're going to move to the next step of building this thing. Yeah. A couple novel things. A couple novel things at a time. Uh, learn as you go. Uh, assume you're going to learn something when you build it that you didn't originally understand. That's all you have to do. Now, I've... So, so you mentioned the uh, the never good enough self-loathing side of uh, designing, but you also believe that you have to have a, a certain ego yeah. to be a good designer. Well, so, aren't ego and self-loathing like kind of related? Yeah, I mean, what's the what, what's the <laughs> like, what would what's the psychology the chip? What's the balance? Oh, I think I think they're kind of like the same the thing. same thing. Well, for me, they are. Uh, you, 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 you hate your stuff less bad than you hate everybody else's stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm highly motivated by negative feelings. Yeah. So, like, you know, like competition, like, uh, animus towards competition really drives me. Uh, I don't know if, like, you know, I've met some designers who are just, like, the nicest people, and I don't get that. <laughs> it's, it's like, how do you get up in the morning and, like, deadlift 500 pounds of, you yeah. know, HFSS uh, drag yeah, yourself into yeah it. like I'm much more like the Rocky style training you know running up a mountain yeah in fact when I run I actually think about things like that I'm like I think about how I'm staying in shape to get more energy to design better hmm. which is really really weird and nerdy I think that's I think that's uh, from what I understand the best way to maintain your mental acuity right improve cardiovascular yeah you know, blood I, flow. I, certainly I feel better like when yeah. I do it, but okay. So, um, what's, is there a relationship between ego, but also like the fear of failure? I think there has to be because mm. you wouldn't be doing it. You wouldn't be trying to become a great designer if you didn't feel like you could win at it or not, win might not be the right word, but be, become successful, compensated, um, gain some level of, of respect from your peers, um, get a lot of personal satisfaction out of achieving something. I mean, it's, it's like achieving anything in life. If you want to become a great piano player, you're going to sacrifice, but you wouldn't sacrifice if you didn't think there was a payoff. Right. Um, everybody's payoff of why they do it's probably a lot, a little bit different. Um, but part of getting better is fully appreciating how bad you are. Like, and this is, get, we, we, I think we circle back to like talking to like interviewees a lot, but it's always like meeting an interviewee who has no idea how bad they are. It's always the, the, wor the worst candidate. He's just like, God, you just don't know all the things you don't know yet. Yeah. And so it's like ego, ego without self-loathing <laughs> is a dangerous thing. It's very, very bad. <laughs> very dangerous. <laughs> well, I think that. For mimic design in particular, um, you know, you talk about winning and the motivations that, that drive you behind it, and I think that that's um, well for a lot of for a lot of microwave people, they do what they do because they love the work, and that's why I think why you see so many, especially founders in of microwave companies, 
that are still around way after they have earned their retirement and could be off on a beach somewhere. Mm-hmm. And they're still coming into work every day because that's what they want to do and that's what, what makes them feel good. But to the, the mimic uh, economy, you know, we talk about how we're a hardware company, but in a lot of ways, mimics are a lot like software in that you have to do the design once and then you can replicate your work an well, arbitrary yeah. number of times. If, so if you're a mimic designer, your output is like a GDS file? Yeah. One which GDS is software. File. Yeah. So you yeah. are you are a producer Plants. of a software product. Yeah. It's just it turns out that software product can become hardware actualized at a foundry. But you right. don't need the engineer for that. Right. Okay. And and that means that when I say fire the the engineer, that's actually literally what happens to some people. And how yeah, many if it's a consultant? How many design, how many mimic designers have we met who used to work at you know some major place? Yeah, and it's like, why would you have ever left? Oh, they probably didn't need you anymore because they already had your amp. Yeah, <laughs> they, you were totally they completed expendable. their line of VCOs, yeah. and yeah. it was time to see the door. That's right. And I think that this is this is very there's a big difference between a, a mimic design and like you could say. If you're a designer of any product, once you have the design, you're done, right? But if you designed a car, they would keep you around until, for as long as the car was in production, because there are inevitably going to be problems. There's going to be tires that you can't source, and they're going to need to consult with somebody on which tire they can get as a replacement. But when you've got mimics, you can print 20,000 at a time or 50,000 at a time. The problems are that the, the processes are so much more dialed down at uh, foundries that it's it's it becomes more than a, a difference of degree it becomes a difference in kind where you really don't need the designer anymore and so when you're talking about winning at mimic design you really do need to win you can't make uh, the second best the third best design mm-hmm. because there's no reason you know it doesn't cost any more to make the best design than the second best design so there is no reason to for a customer to choose the second best design. Uh, so one design, it's it's like, why would you use the second best search engine? It's free. It costs right, the same right, amount. Yeah. That's why Google has so much money. Why would you use the second best mimic when the se- the first mimic, the best mimic, uh, costs the same amount? Right. So it's a very much a winner take all. Well, and, that, and so co- that you make a, you use the word cost, I think you meant price. It's the same price, but the cost yeah. is the same. Right. So it costs Marky the exact same amount of money to develop a mimic mixer as it does, you know, competitor X. Well, that's not entirely true because I can do it a lot faster because I have libraries and libraries of designs. But when I was starting from zero, I was actually at a deficit in terms of how much it cost me in my time. But when it comes to the actual direct cost of the material, right, we're in the exact same boat. So then it's all about performance, because if we're all going to have the same cost structure, then then you have to sell on some other metric than cost. And so that's going to be mostly the performance. But then, you know, over time, uh, especially here, we're going to be doing a lot more value added uh, capabilities like software support, um, uh, integration, reliability. These these other things are are obviously valuable to the customer and so so we, we focus on them heavily but because we have no cost advantage it pushes us into those other categories to differentiate right well I was, I was careful not to say price because <laughs> price and cost are very different things and materials cost for a I, I, and this is this isn't private information this is public information look at any um, any semiconductor company on Yahoo Finance, look at their their income statement, their balance sheet, their gross margins are gonna be pretty good. And their overall margins are not gonna be significantly better than uh, other companies in other sectors. And the reasons are because it is, the manufacturing cost to produce a semiconductor is low, but there are a lot of other costs associated. And I think we, we didn't, I think that one of the major things that we didn't realize going into Mimic uh, becoming a mimic company is that you're trading a um, you're trading a, a, a manufacturing problem and a su- one supply chain chain problem 
for a very big alternative supply chain problem, which is inventory management. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure out, you know, when you can order 40,000 of something at, that you don't have never sold, and <laughs> you have to buy potentially several years of several years worth of inventory of a product that you have no idea whether there's a market for or not. Um, that's a very tricky thing to do. You're making much bigger bets. Yes. It's just fundamentally. When, when you yeah. go into a cost model where all of your development costs are up front and there's really no redos or do-overs, well, there are redo-overs, there, there are spinning new masks, yeah. but you're gonna, the, the board masks. of directors may you know cut your whole yeah. division if you do that too many times. So you have to be really careful. And this, this came back, you know, this comes back to the whole question of why, did, why didn't I do Mimic sooner? In hindsight, I wish I had. But there's no way I could have justified the, the bet. It's like um, playing limit poker. Yeah. Like if you ever, like the first time I went to Bay 101, I was like, I was playing two fours or two four. And then I went to like three six. And then as I started to become good at poker and I actually had some money, I was like, oh, let's go play six twelve. Like, that's exactly the same way that I took yeah. took you know the the mimic flow, uh, care, careful wagering of money to make sure that I could still you know have gas gas money to make it home. I that's what I did with that's what I did with stocks. I started off you know with the cheapest stock. Buying, well, I was, I, I was buying like five hundred dollars in stock in grad school. You know, I'd get a hunch and I'd buy like uh, or I'd get a, something that I thought was some kind of tip on a stock, and I kept like doubling my money on thousand dollar stocks or whatever or buying a thousand dollars worth of stock uh, until uh, I finally was like alright now I'm going to make some big bets and and now I'm just going to invest in the S&P 500 <laughs> for, the, for the remaining <laughs> yeah, well, for the remaining of yeah. my career I mean I, I definitely learned that I was uh, not going to be a stock guy when <laughs> when I bought I think 20 shares of Google when it was like IPO Yeah, and I think I made like 30% profit in like a couple months you're like wow and I sold it I was like I'm gonna book this <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna buy myself something nice <laughs> yeah that was like all the money I had too yeah yeah not smarter than Wall Street I, I think I made like $300 I was like this is awesome yeah um so what are the other differences between the being a mimic uh, process company and um being a more traditional microwave company uh, I don't know. What do you think the differences are? I don't think there are that many. I think it's it, pretty dramatic. Okay, so okay, let's go down the list. How about that? Let, let's go down okay. the list of what, what's what's the difference between being a f fabulous IC business versus a what, hybrid component house? Is it? Yeah, we could say a, 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 okay. a hybrid switch, you know, okay. manufacturer. So, arbitrary. okay, um, software tools identical. Yeah, measurement equipment mostly identical. Measurement equipment, yeah, completely identical. Okay, which is like one of the biggest uh, barriers to entry to becoming a microwave company is well, the measurement equipment. Getting back to why couldn't we do? Why couldn't people do mimics before? During the last episode, we talked about why didn't um, you know why were mixers not more advanced in the '90s? Uh, I was arguing that the software tools were not as good. Yeah, I also think that the measurement equipment. Measurements were much, much lo more laborious, particularly yes. on nonlinear devices. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, even at the beginning of my career, yeah. ten years ago, um, the advances. I, I don't even know. I, I wonder what is going to be cap what we're going to be capable of ten years in the future, because you can already almost completely characterize the nonlinear uh, metrics of a mixer um, if you are careful about setting up the template. You can. Measure them immediately if you're willing to spend you know five hundred thousand dollars on a test setup from a major test equipment manufacturer, but basically the same. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the same between a hybrid hybrid company and a mimic company. Well, I think it would be faster to say what are the differences. Uh, you cannot. Supply chain is a huge difference. How how you structure your supply chain has got to be different. Yeah, the like supply chain is obviously like the, the very biggest thing. You have to do much more planning, um, much more careful assessment of. So, imagine that you were, uh, you know, Bill Engineer, a, a brilliant designer of some product, and you wanted to start a company. Uh, 
say you wanted to start a say you're a switch designer and you wanted to start a hybrid switch company versus being a mimic switch designer and starting a mimic switch company if you want to start a hybrid switch company you probably need to spend ten thousand dollars to build your first switch you buy <laughs> right. some diodes yeah. or pin diodes or whatever you buy uh, you get some aluminum housings machined for uh, you know a couple thousand bucks from any machine shop you buy some circuits you buy some connectors yeah. and you've got your first set of 10 switches made uh, almost immediately for short short lead times and, and not much money mm-hmm. um, getting to the next 10,000 takes a long time if you're a, a, a mimic switch uh, designer then step one is buy layout software how are you going to make the drawings <laughs> yeah because you can make the drawings for we, we make drawings well for, no, I, I would even say it starts before that it's uh talk to a foundry and ask if they'd even be willing to do business with you <laughs> see <laughs> because, if they'll answer your calls yeah like yeah. I remember calling triquint this is this is like maybe like let's say a year before we committed fully to making mimics. It's when they were triquint. It's when they were triquint, and I called up triquint and I was like, "Hi, I'm Chris Markey of Markey Microwave," thinking that that would help. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like my name's on the you know <laughs> on the marquee. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy. <laughs> I'm like the son of the guy. Yeah, and uh, I have power to spend money if you will allow me, and uh, <laughs> and and they're, they're, I was like, I want to do mimics with you guys. Because I heard other people are doing mimics with you. Yeah, that's true, Chris. Um, so how many hundreds of wafers will you run per month? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, 0. 0.01 every year <laughs> would be my starting R&D budget. <laughs> <laughs> and he hung up the phone. Slightly under. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was like, and that was, that was shocking to me because I figured that, you know, like, why would you ever turn down... A customer that yeah. didn't make sense to me because I, I never would turn down customers and yeah. to this day probably should more than I do but like you know I just think projects are interesting <laughs> yeah. like, especially when when it's somebody I hadn't talked to before who um, may have something to teach me about something they know <laughs> but yeah they just hung up and, and you've had this experience with Silicon Germanium I think right yeah. Marky Microwave of today has yeah. been rejected by yeah, so like in Germanian people, and you're like, really, guys? Like, are we still not good looking enough to get yeah. a drink bought for us? Like, yeah, it's a it's a clue what when the heck, man when like four business development managers show up to a meeting, and you're like, I I, I was planning on doing like, <laughs> you know, maybe trying something out, yeah. and they're like, how many how many thousands of wafers do you plan to run per week? <laughs> And I told so them which my, handset my is this estimate. for? <laughs> which base and, station uh, or handset is this for? They don't even bother asking about like the application. They just assume it's yeah, going to yeah. be commercial. Is this like a router or more of a modem? Is it a Wi-Fi yeah. for like yeah. a drone? Uh, and it reminded me of the scene from the the Big Lebowski where uh, he's at the funeral par- parlor and they're like, uh, "Sir, this is our most." modest receptacle <laughs> they they pointed me to their most modest <laughs> process <laughs> they actually show you like you know a completely different company yeah They're like these guys sell discrete silicon diodes you might just want to toy around with those little yeah. boy <laughs> yeah they directed me to a distributor of foundry services oh, yeah. that's that's good uh Have i wanted met moses yeah i want to uh, to describe a process I, I we've been using the term process and this is something that I wanted to make a distinction between uh, mimics and other types of vendors. So typically when you, as a hybrid component company, when you're trying to make a, a product, either you're making a housing or you're making a circuit uh, or you're using, you know, well devices are, are more commodities, but when you're making a drawing for a housing or a circuit, you come up with what you want and then you basically like call the production manager on the phone and or you send the drawing over and some guy is probably named like Scott or John looks it looks it over (laughs) and it's like uh, this corner is too tight you're gonna have to give me some more relief there and this thing is uh, I I don't like the angle of this so and that that plating is no good Uh, we can probably only do well maybe we can do that plating we'll try it. it's negotiable it's all negotiable everything's negotiable yeah it's 
whatever you can get him to sign up for. And he may or may not, probably may not be able to produce that six months from now. Uh, but he'll, you know, he'll, he'll do what he can do to get the, the business. Uh, and that's part of the reason that you run into so many problems is because getting hard and fast rules about what they'll supply uh, from most vendors is difficult because they don't necessarily know. When you go to a semiconductor foundry, a pure play foundry, they know exactly what they will sign up for and they have it in a document called their, their design rule document, their, their uh, process guide. And it's per process. So they have a process that has a device on it. The device might be a transistor. Um, it might be uh, like a, a bipolar transistor or a, um, a P-hemp transistor. And they know exactly what they're going to do. And they know what devices they can include with it, what types of resistors they can do, what kind of uh, crossovers they can do. And they have rules for every single aspect of how you lay out the circuit. And when you send in your file, they don't have a guy that looks at it and is like, ah, <laughs> oh, maybe it'll work, we'll try it. They look, they run software on the, the design and the software tells them whether you have violated any of the rules. And the rules are constantly updated and they uh, run a qualification on the process and then the process is the process. And the bigger the foundry is, the more the process is the process, the yes. less variation they will tolerate within their process. Yep. To the point where when you get to a, this is what, what so makes it's, it. So it's rigid but beautiful and clean. It's like. Yeah, you know exactly what you're going to get. It's, it's essentially a piece of perfectly written software. Yeah. It's. Yeah, it softwareizes. It softwareizes the whole development process, which is why, it, you know, there's, I'm sure that there's a relationship here between how perfect design rule checks are and the fact that you can fire an IC engineer after you have his mask. Yeah. <laughs> because it's so like, it makes you I, I have the software, the software checked my software, I have, no, I have a product now, we don't need you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, I think that's almost, I think what you've described is uh, the paradigm of the modern economy, which is anything that can be converted into an algorithm can be made by a computer and fire the guy that does it. That's right. So th there's an interesting, um, there's an interest, I can't remember, there's, there's a paradox. I can't remember what it, there, there's some paradox that some guy came up with in AI. And the paradox is something like the more complicated and white collar the job is, the more likely it's going to be AI'd. Yeah. And the lower level it, uh, the job, like uh, let's say like janitorial services, the less likely AI is going to fix that anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a paradox and, and you can see it perfectly with what we do. Like I think, Absolutely. like right now I'm writing scripting to design filters. And I'm trying to fire myself out of the entire algorithm because it's like I do the same thing over and over again manually. I don't need to do this manually. Yeah. And and the best the best designers, especially the best IC designers, I think, understand this, and they write their own scripting toolboxes and they, they have a toolkit, and they and they roll around with this toolkit and they they whip out these these specialized jackhammers to hammer out designs very quickly. Yeah. That are at the highest level. So that's another another problem for an undergrad angling for a design <laughs> job is that yeah. your toolkit is empty. Yeah. All you have is what your professor gave you in undergrad, which was probably ADS, because ADS or, or AWR, you know, they're free for students. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually, you know, in addition to home scripting, which, you know, everybody's got their own home scripts, uh, there are professional companies, which are typically one dude one software person or one like uh, microwave person that's written some scripts and when you work on a computer program for an entire career you can make an incredibly good computer program to solve um, to solve closed-ended problems like impedance matching um, or filter design or you know that first part if if you have learned how to design a filter in ADS as an undergrad you have learned to do what software already knows how to do extremely well. Mm -hmm. It's like when they teach you how to do a Fourier transform. Like no, yep. nobody pays you to do a Fourier transform yep. because we've got software to do that yep. now. Nobody will get a job designing filters the way they do in ADS in school. Yeah, yeah. If you want to be a pro, if you want to do bush league stuff, you can do it. But if you want to make your money yeah. as a professional filter designer, there are people out there who've already done everything. <laughs> the Simpsons already did it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So 
because foundries are basically perfect, as as perfect as you can really hope to get, I think, with hardware. They're, yeah, they, they'll do what they sign up to do. They do what they sign up to do. Uh, and, and the hybrid the, the hybrid component supply chain is not like that. Yeah. Uh, so th- that is a major paradigm difference. Um, and I think what it's done is, is, is it's spoiled us in the, real, the realization of working with foundries versus working with, let's say, some PCB vendors. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want them to get mad at me, but like, you know, it can be a nightmare. I think every PCB vendor <laughs> who you're, you're with, so any anybody listening that is a PCB vendor, uh, I, I I cannot name a PCB vendor that we have had a seamless relationship with. No, it's true. Even the good ones that we love, yeah. there are always fights and breakups, and then yeah. you then you realize that every other PCB vendor has their own flaws, and you go back to the one that that brought you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's only so many, so you 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 don't have like. <laughs> You can't just you know burn the bridge. You have to stay diplomatic. Yeah. Now, but this is so. This is a uh, something that I worry about. That is a risk that we are exposed to as a mimic company. That is not a risk uh, for a or the the risk is that everybody has the access to the same processes. The processes are advertised. There are only a handful of foundries, um, and it's and not in the foundries. Who they are? It's not in the foundries' interest. To not make it widely accessible, yeah. they won't make you a, yeah. a special product. No. They might make you a special product. Some of them might make you a special process, but they won't. You know how much? How many millions of dollars would you have to pay them to keep? How a many process? hundreds of wafers, Doug, For are you going to be running yeah. per month? <laughs> then they'll consider it. <laughs> Hello, is this Apple? Yeah. yeah yes. Oh, who mic- microwave? Yeah. Can you but spell that? <laughs> some, some Apple engineers are listening to this and be like, "Oh, those little chumps." Yeah. yeah. Taiwan Semi is listening to everything we ask. <laughs> I remember when I was an intern at uh, at Intel, and uh, they had Semicon. You know, so everybody was like, "Oh, you got to go up to Semicon West. You just show the blue badge, man. You can get on anywhere." <laughs> I was like, "Where, where do I want to go yeah. up there?" Yeah, yeah. yeah um, we we pay, we pay for our drinks, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, if everybody, so so when you are a hybrid component company, when you're a boutique company. Your supply chain is a, comp- a competitive advantage. You don't reveal your suppliers because you have literally spent money, like thousands of dollars, bringing that supplier up to the to the quality standards. That and a lot of times teaching them how to make your stuff, mm-hmm. uh, working through the. If you're at the cutting edge of an RF microwave design, yeah. you are pushing them harder than they like to be pushed. And this is why yeah. we. This is why Marky uniquely as a RF microwave company. Has issues with with PCB because we don't yeah. buy FR four. Yeah, <laughs> we buy advanced laminates, and they're harder to work with. And there's lot to lot variations and all these things. And yeah, so that's a good point. Like, so so your supply chain is both your advantage and your curse. Yeah, I mean things that are hard are competitive advantages, right? Yes. If and there's fewer. If they're fewer necessary. In the, in the in the more cutting edge it is, the fewer people can do it. Yeah. Yeah, you're always. If they say that the the tolerance is two, then you're going to go to two. You're not going to go to three or right. four. You're going to go right up to what you can do because there's some limiting factor on every design. Right. Uh, and a lot of times it's the, you know, the coupling, the the fabrication tolerance on the circuit, um, the coupling between two things. Oh, okay. So I want I want to mention that. So you you just remo- you said you know if, if the limit if the if the limitations two, let's say let's say gap spacing is two mm-hmm. mil whatever it might be. Uh, my advice to any young engineer listening to this, if if the vendor says they can do a two mil gap comfortably, make it three. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the thing that when I was like a young designer talking to these vendors and you know thinking that everybody would tell me the truth and they aren't, yeah. they're, they're trying to win the business. And you know, I'm not talking to the, the process expert in the factory, I'm talking to the salesperson. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so know who you're talking to. The salesperson says they can do too. They give the drawing to the process guy, and he's like, "Bob, what the hell are you doing, man? <laughs> Come on, just do it this one time." Yeah, do it the one time. I got a customer. So, so you get that first time, and it actually is too. Yeah. And you're like, "Oh, this is sweet. Let's let's make this a product." And then the next time, it's like, "No, it's not two anymore." <laughs> yeah. That happened with Microlithic. I think you know that story. I think it's happened on a number of. It hasn't happened. I don't. Has it ever happened with Mimic for us? Well, 
Not really. Not for Mimics, but for other uh, circuit. It's happened on thin film and it's happened on laminate. Technology. Where yeah, laminate. where we got essentially like told that price went up because yields yeah. got bad because we followed their design rules. Well, that's what happens is they don't, they can't not do it. They just double the price. Yes, <laughs> because the yield is half of what they expected. Because the dude, the dude and the 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 factory manager couldn't go home until midnight one night and he got really angry with the sales team. <laughs> yeah. So we've been talking a lot about um, Mimics uh, and the transition to a Mimic uh, company, the transition to Mimic processes. Is Marky a Mimic only company? Is, is Marky another Fabulous IC company? Or if not, how, does, how do Mimics fit into the larger, uh, the larger frame of Marky Microwave? Yeah, this is something that we, I think, actually talk about a lot internally. You know, what's our value compared to competitors? What what do we do differently or, or specially that other people can't do or would take them a long time or a lot of money to, to compete on? And um, so the way I look at it is this. A lot of people know how to do hybrid components. And you see a lot of smaller businesses that, that have been around for some a long amount of time, you know, like kind of like my dad's era generation. Um, they have their own small businesses and they, they're all successful. They can't do mimics because it's too hard to, to penetrate into. You have to spend a lot of time. Um, then there's the opposite company, which is the fabulous IC mimic company, usually some kind of spin off of Hittite or some designer or, you know, a, a, a fired division of Maycom, yeah. um, which you know, you've seen several startups recently about that. And um, so you have the, the IC based paradigm yeah so we're a little bit unique in that we have both and I think that's a tremendous advantage so the reason that we do mimic and the reason we got into mimic was to secure our supply chain uh, because we were worried about diodes and it was also so that we could provide ourselves finally an internal roadmap for mixer development that could only be achieved through semiconductor uh, full-blown monolithic semiconductor it would not have been sufficient just to convince a diode company to develop new devices. We had to get everything integrated and optimized in HFSS really to get the kind of performance that our customers want today. And you know, the one of the byproducts of that which we haven't even touched on is uh, the PDK we offer. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned if we all have the same cost structure, then performance matters, but so does development speed. And so we're to date, the only company in the world that offers nonlinear mixer models of all of our Mimic product. And so you plop it into Microwave Office or, or um, ADS, and you can probe this physics-based model quickly and easily and, and discover all kinds of things about the products that we didn't even know about uh, because I didn't design for it. So um, the Mimic space is obviously where all the technology will drive, but you can't escape packaging. Right. And this circles back to the, to the Achilles heel of all of these fabulous semiconductor companies is they don't understand packaging. And maybe, or maybe they do, maybe I should give them more credit, but let's be honest, if you don't have a factory of 50 to 100 operators working with so, uh, solder reflow ovens and working with pick and place machines and doing hand assembled product and working with all the different types of solder you can buy uh, you just don't have the skill set you need to support customers on their most challenging problems and these days those problems have to do with uh, essentially swap reduction right so size weight power and, and cost um, sometimes but we're talking to customers who are who are miniaturizing their their receivers by a factor of what four to ten? Yeah. You know, things that used to be on a credit card can now be on a quarter. Yeah, postage stamp. A postage stamp, and so um, just being good at an IC design will not get you there. Like just having those GDS files that you send to a, fa a, a foundry to build you those wafers does not do you any good, yeah. because you still have to provide it to the customer in a way that they can use, which almost always is surface mount, right? But there's other things you can do. 
Um, so what I look at is I say, okay, we have the factory that can do the packaging. We have the personnel, which we have the team that can do that. We have the ability to do our own internal reliability studies. And now we have the IC that has been developed over the past five years. When you marry those two, there's only, how many companies would you say possess both those capabilities in-house in our industry? I think there are two. Us and ADI? I, I, don't, I think ADI outsources their packaging. They do some of it in-house, I'm sure. They, they have, I, I'm sure that they have some capability. I don't think that they have the, um, the extent of capability that we've got. And who else? Maycom? I think mini circuits can do. Oh, mini circuits, a lot of packaging. Well, okay, so I would say Maycom, mini circuits, ADI. Maybe ADI, because they, well, okay. ADI doesn't, I don't think, sell anything that touches, that's handmade. Is that, we'll have to ask one of, somebody from No, there. I, I think that's, that's correct. Maycom sells things that are handmade, but I think that there's. Yeah, they still sell mix, they sell hybrid mixers to they, this day. They do, uh, but I, I, I think that there's, they're such an, they're almost a holding company in, in a lot of ways. Like well, as of this morning, I'm not quite sure what they are either. I think there's, I, I think if you're an IC person. We'll at, see when this airs, by the way. Like, so yeah. we should, we should mark the date. We're recording yeah, this on uh, uh, June 19th. Yeah. And that means that this come. morning was the announcement for a 20, 20% layoff. By the time this reaches the airwaves, we don't know what Mr. Daly will do. Well, we don't know what state the economy is going to be in because there have been yeah. Huawei. There have been yeah. shockwaves from Huawei. Oh yeah, and especially in the electronic components industry, because it was specifically a ban of electronic components mm -hmm. by against the largest consumer of electronic components in in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I I think that there's a lot of reverberations that are going to be echoing for for many years i think that, i think that someday we'll be like oh that was right after the huawei ban so so doug um how much money have we lost from this huawei ban <laughs> I, I think we had an order from huawei <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah i do believe we, we had well, i think i think we have to make a pre-announcement that we've uh we're down about two thousand dollars q q3 <laughs> results have been revised downward point zero zero one percent yeah yeah, so Marky is completely unaffected by this, so it's a really yeah. interesting uh, position to be in. Um. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea because it's a position of strength in a field of weakness, which is, you know, a promising place to be. Yeah, well, I, I think it's actually a bad thing. I, I would prefer this, t from a competitiveness point of view, to not happen because I think what it's going to, the sharks will circle to now possibly go after some of our market. The yeah, th they the, will. The thing that we like to work with may be appealing now to the people who got banned from Huawei. Oh, I don't, I think it's gonna shake out weak players because, I mean, business is cyclical and it's been a long time since we've had a downturn. It's been a long time since we've had a down cycle. And so even weak companies have been carried for the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, I think in the next four years, I, 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 of our competitors, I think that many of them will close their doors, um, especially the newer ones. And if there's others, a downturn, other divisions will be removed. I, I, I think there's, it, at least in our industry, I think it's, I can't imagine. I'm going to, I'm going to claim <laughs> June 19th, 2019. I'm going to stake my, my claim. Is this, this the Jorgensen top? The high water mark. <laughs> yes, this is the Jorgensen top. And I, I'm going to short. Uh, oh, the, no. I'm going to short our industry for the next I mean, ADI's years. multiple is pretty ridiculous. I, mean, I know this because I own ADI, and I can't believe they're multiple. But at the same time, it's like they're a monopoly on so many things. I was just looking at Cree. If you think GAN is good, then you think Cree is great. Yeah. And Cree has not made money in four years. Really? I was shocked to see because I thought for sure they would be. All right, you're, if, 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 did you read those statements properly? Because you're going to get some hate mail from like the CFO. <laughs> I I, th I think that Cree when from the outside Cree looks like a great company to me. Yeah. Like they just look, they they just look like they are pretty put together. And maybe I just don't know enough about Cree. Maybe they're a mess inside. Well, but okay, but, but, well but there's there's managed. there's Cree, which is also like the lighting and all that. And then there's Wolf Speed, which is like the RF side, right? Yeah, I think the Wolf Speed side makes money. 
they have revenue, but you, I, they right. don't I, disaggregate the costs. You, so you, that's they have they have like a billion and a, they're a six billion dollar company market cap with a billion and a half in revenue, and cost of revenue of like one point two billion dollars. So and then when you add uh, R and D uh, and SGNA, it's they're losing money, which I I was confounded by. I don't know. Yeah. So, Jorgensen Market Top is now, and I think that there will be a struggle in the future. But the struggle's already taken out all of our um, weak um, hybrid component companies, competitors. Yeah. So that'll be a field of strength. What I think is interesting about um, the mimic, the mimic side of the company. Um, whatever we are four years into the, the process, four years, to, five years down the road, is how much I've started to see Mimic as another tool in the toolbox, along with, um, you know, if a customer comes with a problem, I think, can we do it with a Mimic? No, there's, for whatever, you know, the, you can't do that with a Mimic because you have to mix processes or because you have to, um, so you, you, could, you could do it with two Mimics. But then you have to wire, you have to bond them together somehow into a multi-chip module, or you can't do it with a mimic at all because they need a power divider that goes down to one gigahertz. So you have to do that with uh, some kind of other circuit, or you can do it in a mimic. Like it's it's another way to solve the problem, which is in some ways I think a, a specialty of ours, which is collecting the best possible ways to solve each problem mm-hmm. and having all of them at our disposal. Yeah, we're technology agnostic. Agnostic. In the, yeah. With, with with the upper limit being the cost of a particular development. Like, yeah. I would love to work on 45 nanometer SOI, <laughs> but I'm not going to be spending a million dollars on masks. And, and and they won't answer my call anyway. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I look at silicon and I, I see chains, man. I oh, yeah. see, like... That's true. Uh, For our business model, it's completely incompatible. Yeah, it looks like a lot of work for what professors argue. I, I mean, they've... This is a, this to me. This is an interesting uh, like role between academia and and commerce. In that professors have spent like the last ten years developing the the technology so that silicon can make what it used to take used to require gallium arsenide. So SIGI and and uh, silicon. You look at the um, you look at a company like Analog Devices, and they're pretty much just promoting SIGI chips. They've uh, to my, as far as I can tell, they have left three fives. Uh, behind them, or at least in the tail of their their silicon development, uh, and this has been developed by like the the core IP has been created by a bunch of professors everywhere, uh, which who have been working feverishly on this for for many years, um, and so in a way it's weird that they've been, you know, the government's sort of been subsidizing the um, decline of the three five industry when it comes to these mass commercial products. But at the same time, the benefits, you know, there should be tremendous benefits to the consumer because the silicon is so great. And I don't know. We'll see. Well, there's benefits to the consumer above a certain threshold of volume. (laughs) And and this is this is the thing that like one day we should talk about the economics of the mimic or IC space. Yeah. And maybe like it would be good if we could bring in somebody who was like a silicon expert yeah. Who really understood the costs? Because we don't really know like what the cost is to do silicon germanium versus yeah. SOI or whatever. We just know it's a lot. It's like an order of magnitude more than what we do today. Right. And so you just do some really simple economic, you know, sunk cost versus you know future earning yeah. revenue, and you look how many months or years out you would expect to make a profit, and or how many widgets do you have to sell to make a profit. Yeah, what's and what's your point? ASP or average sale price of, of those particular widgets? And it's like, that's where I always get depressed and walk away from any silicon idea yeah. because it just doesn't make sense for the small to medium volume customers. Yeah. So on, on that point of what is the crossover point where you start to make money? I think that that's another big strength as a mimic company having packaging every time I've looked at the array of so for every mimic, almost every mimic we offer in as a bare die as a surface mount 
and as a connectorized module. And I've considered the question of whether we should continue to do this. It's a lot of work to make a separate set of drawings, a lot of times a separate data sheet, um, have a separate inventory. A lot of our competitors will only offer a, a chip in a single package, surface mount or bare die, and rarely as a module, sometimes as an eval board. So why go through the effort? And what you see is there are a lot of, there's still a lot of connectorized module projects out there. There are still a lot of companies, like, they're not, not companies, but projects, even at big companies, where they're making a small test system and they need 40, uh, 40 test systems. Is it worth making a surface mount board or a connectorized, uh, uh, will a connectorized system do? And so between hundreds of small projects, um, you can sell a lot of modules, and that lowers the crossover threshold for a new Mimic design significantly because of the, the higher revenue from the modules. And what that allows us to do that I think is a tremendous service to our customers is have a broader catalog. We can offer many, we can support many, many more chips because we can release them and pay off the development using the connectorized sales um, and when you're making, when you're doing a design, selection is performance, because it's very difficult for us to predict a priori what uh, if there are multiple models that will cover cover a single requirement. Say it's a frequency plan and you need a mixer. We don't really know which mixer is going to be the best until we measure them all or simulate them all. Right. We have to, you know, my favorite parts that I think are amazing sometimes suck yeah. for a given, you know, under given circumstances. Sometimes they get beat in ways that you wouldn't expect. It's very difficult to make a part that's uniformly better across every spec. Um, and so having that, that broad catalog and continuing to support the broad catalog um, you know, is a big benefit of having all the pack packaging technology that we've got. Well, there's something else that, you, and you said it, it's like, so if you can offset the development costs through module sales, which captures it you know a really different customer set mm -hmm. it's like researchers lab people yeah. um i mean how, how many modules did we buy in grad school like I, I bought a lot of shf equipment so i spent 50 grand with those guys and two two modules yeah i bought two modules <laughs> for twenty five thousand dollars each, each yeah. yeah yeah it is good it stuff it is the best it's the best but uh um what that also does and i think this is something that is completely underappreciated by our bigger rivals who only want to develop a chip for a you know, seven figure return. Uh, they aren't allowing their engineers to get creative and do weird things that may only sell to, yeah. but also may completely break the paradigm and give you something nobody's ever seen before. Like we have things right now that in, you know, we're not talking about them, but they'll, they'll see the light of day within the next six to 12 months that nobody has seen before. And the only reason I was able to even work on those designs was because we were making cash flow on previous designs. Right. And we got there much faster. We were able to iterate very fast because we had more than just chip sales and more than just QFN sales. We had module sales. And since we do it in-house, we could do it for an affordable price. And you know, there you have it. So. When you go and look at, I was just taking somebody on a tour today, showing the reliability area where we're, you know, you're burning in these high power amps yeah. that we're working on, and we're burning in these uh, high linearity mixers that we're working on, and beating, you know, beating the crap out of them in the ovens to make sure that they don't break in the field test. And I'm showing this guy the setup, and everything in there's a marquee product. Yeah. So there's a marquee power divider. <laughs> it's like uh, you ever seen a boomerang. <laughs> Huh. I, so there's okay. There's this movie Boomerang with uh, Eddie Murphy. I think yeah. it is. It's it's a good movie. You should watch it. It's funny. But uh, he's got like this uncle or like dad or somebody. He shows up like to like a dinner party and, and he 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 coordinates everything. He's like, I got the mushroom shirt and the mushroom hat <laughs> and the mushroom belt. So like, I always think about that. Like it's it's such an esoteric reference. But somebody somebody out there in podcast land is laughing because I got the you know, the marquee power divider and I got the marquee amp and I got the marquee yeah. whatever. The only thing in there that wasn't a marquee product was like the cable. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like a cable. But I had connector. this whole setup. Was how many how many widgets are we burning in? Like 
16 or something like that? Yeah, something like that. So, like, that setup yeah. with all the power dividers and all the amplification and all the all the whatever else is in there, couplers, you name it, um, that's probably a $30,000 setup. Yeah. That we did, well, for quote unquote, it's free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what the actual cost is, but the point is there are so many applications where the volumes aren't going to be great. But if, as if you build an infrastructure uh, based on really like well designed and well built product, it gives you this uh, virtuous cycle of development that that lets you go a lot faster over the time to- over time. And so you know that's that's how I started. Um, my dad set the foundation, and uh, I said, okay, what else can we build? And you, and you just go from there. And so after a while, you start looking at the catalog. You're like, wow, we have a lot of product. And so that selection is what you're talking about. So the selection is your advantage. And it's kind of ironic that when people come to me and you and they ask for what the best mixer is for a particular application, we just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think, I don't know if it makes us look bad or what, but we're honest and we say, uh, the truth is I can't tell you what the best two by one spur is gonna be because it's gonna depend on about a thousand different things. Yeah. So. You have two options. You can send us the frequency plan, and we'll measure every mixer we can find for you. Yeah, that fits. And that's, that was my dad's way, and we still do that to this day, right? Uh, that's a near continuous job yeah. at Marky Microwave. First thing you learn as an yeah. engineer. And, and, and inevitably, they're going to screw up the two-by-one up. Yeah. And then, uh, or we tell the customer, just go download the PDK and do it yourself because it'll be faster. <laughs> The self-serving reason behind the PDK that... Oh, absolutely. Uh, Look, there's up. nothing wrong with being lazy. Yeah. We talk about this all the time with our, our own people. Yeah. Being lazy is a virtue. And doing things more than like three times is... is uh, now you're just getting wasteful. Yeah. If, if you have to now do something three money. times uh, repeatedly, then automate the whole thing so you never have to do it again. Yeah. And that's what the PDK is. <laughs> now, we haven't written a script yet. <laughs> to, to cycle through, I was just thinking about this this morning. So we, you know, you, you create your, your schematic with the frequency plan, you measure, you, and you want to cycle through all the different mixer options. There should be a button you can push Yeah. that just, you know, files through every single option and then spits out the result. Well, this was the ambitious early uh, goal of the, the mixer cal- calculator online. We had, yeah. we had the PDK around the same time. And the initial idea, if, I think if you look at the, the mixer calculator, it has a drop down box that says what what model what spur model do you want to use right and the only one in there is Burt Henderson's yeah and it's a sort of patched version of that but the original intent was to have a, a software backend where you could use you could link up to the PDK and pull estimates of the spurs from oh my god I just thought of the best idea all right so the ma- y- y- you guys are listening to the magic as it happens <laughs> so here's so, the idea Doug so somebody goes into your spur calculator they, they drop the frequency plan and then they hit go or whatever and it, you know does the spur mm-hmm. web or whatever GUI that they're using at, the, at that moment and then there's a button at the bottom that says export this mm-hmm. frequency plan to microwave office or ADS It'll spit out because it'll it, you can transfer all of those data sets yeah. to a macro or a script, which can then import that and drop the entire mixer like measurement setup. Yeah, and then you can hit go to cycle through every single mixer that we have. Would it, would it export uh, like an ADS file or an MWO file, like a dot? No, all you would need to know schematic. really all you're doing is you would be passing the fields of you know. Uh, RF min, RF max, LO min, LO yeah. max, and IF out. Oh yeah, and you've got a pre-made. And you and so you all as long as you yeah. can populate those fields into a script, that script can then create the microwave office file. Yeah. Which then you would hit another script to say, find me the best marquee mixer in the PDK for this particular spur. That would be really that for an experienced scripter, that's like a day of work. Chris Markey, yeah, script kitty, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm again. I'm lazy. I don't want to yeah. have to do this. Like it's a, it's and it's awesome. Like when you pretty, get it done, it's awesome. It feels good when it's done, and it's boring yeah. as hell when you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Getting back to the, the that layout example or the the 
burn-in example you were giving, I always thought that was one of the most awesome things about being a uh, an en- being a, an applications engineer here is that you've got you you can do a hundred thousand dollar experiment <laughs> with just the stuff that you've got sitting around. You go check out a few things from in- inventory, and uh, you pick up some prototypes that haven't been released, and you can do the best possible experiment um, for you know data communication system or whatever. Um, you can make make these giant elaborate experiments and you suck up all the you know adapters in the lab and everybody gets kind of mad at you over that um, but you can do that because as a component company the broader I, I don't think anybody else has an applications lab that has quite that capability because well, many circuits under, but I don't think that they have their inventory under the same roof as their applications maybe they do maybe every, everybody's in Brooklyn but I think that they're a little more more I think as the more capabilities you have the bigger a company you are the bigger a company you are the less access you have to each you know, area in the company. Um, but that... that well, and they don't have a marquee power divider, let's be honest. <laughs> they don't have the best power divider. I uh, didn't design their stuff, so I don't know. I can't vouch for it. <laughs> Not made here. Not made yeah. here. Uh, but I think that the, the, that idea that, you know, you, said, you were saying you can make something that's really cool that's only going to sell two, uh, kind of gets to the core of the ethos of the company versus a bigger company that is a money-making company. Like, yeah. we're not really a money... I mean, we're a money-making company, and it's fun to make money. Um, but we're not public. We're not designed to maximize shareholder value. There's no, you know, there's no legal obligation to maximize shareholder value. Mm. Uh, and so we can do things that are fun and cool and make awesome products without having a, a lot of stress over the fact that it didn't, you know, you're not going to get fired for having a, a, a product that didn't sell as well as you thought it would. Yeah. If so it's I, a great yeah. product. And I think, and I think we can put a capstone on this entire conversation with, with a pretty simple summary, which is that was always my dad's approach. Yeah. He did. Okay. So he did this to make money in the sense that he wanted enough money to remain free. Yeah. He was really just trying to buy his freedom. To design what he wanted to work on and work on interesting products such that his family could eat right? yeah and in my opinion we don't really do anything different from his original vision yeah we are doing I do exactly I behave from like I guess my creative point of view exactly like my dad did uh, I go home and I think about these things and I come in and I work on them and I don't ask for other people's permission and I don't run this past the board of directors and try to co- make some convincing investment advantage to thesis. why I, yeah investment thesis as to why um, this will net us 10 million dollars of revenue at Huawei next year like it's not that's not a thing we do yeah we 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 have our ideas we shop them around internally but we also shop them to the customers something some of them stick to the wall some of them don't and you know this really well. It doesn't always matter if it's going to be profitable. What matters is does it get us some added value beyond what we currently can do today? Yeah. Well, I, you don't know. Nobody knows if a product's going to be yeah. profitable. No well, one can predict yeah. the future. And that is and Either that or is at our competitors. And that's the great fallacy of of that top-down innovation model yeah. that you see with a lot of the bigger companies. So, you, you know, we we have competitors who have really great designers but they can't get their products launched because the marketing team says it's not going to generate enough revenue. Yeah. And that's, a, yeah. that's an insane policy. But they need to pretend to know because they yeah. have to justify their jobs. Yeah. And so I think we can summarize with, uh, if you are one of those engineers <laughs> working at one of these big companies that we compete with, and if you're sick and tired of the marketing team telling you what your products can and cannot sell to, and, ha- and, and, and whether your ideas are good or not good, yeah. because the customer did or did not ask, you should give me or Doug a call because we can probably help you. Careers at MarkingMicroWave.com. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, look, if you believe in what we believe, which is that you know, the innovation comes first, and then if it's valuable, the customers will buy it, then my dad did it, and I'm doing it. And uh, that's why we're doing ICs. <laughs> <laughs>